So welcome, uh, welcome you all to this uh, guest talk. Uh, I, I have a CV of somebody who is here, but if I start going through the CV, I don't think we'll have the talk today. So I'll just introduce as a good friend, uh, Dr. Sian Ionchilev, whom I know and many of the uh, uh, Aravind doctors know him for the last 15, 16 years. So I met him when he was a resident uh, uh, in uh, ASCRS at San Diego way back in 2013 when he was presenting about aphakic refraction, doing intraoperatively and then correcting so that you don't get any refractive surprises, which people were not worried about much those days. No, they just took it lightly when he presented. But after a few years, no, it became a big talk of the town, and then it became a, a very big area called intraoperative aborometry, and he was the father of intraoperative aborometry. And uh, there started his life of innovation, and he has tested his innovation in all the fields of ophthalmology. That is the interesting part. So starting from uh, cataract surgery, then it went into uh, retinal field. So he worked just after his residency for a company to develop a drug which is the most popular drug for intravitreal injections called the Lucentis. And from then on, he went to develop a company called Eantech, which had a lot of innovations. And one innovation which we are all aware and we are going to do even a trial with that is the My Loop, you know, which is used to uh, bisect or even trisect a cataractus nucleus in the bag so that you can use very less energy to emulsify or even without emulsification you can do a cataract surgery. And the future of cataract surgery is his innovation which he's going to introduce in the talk. It's called the MyPort. Now I won't tell much about it but you can see on the talk. And there are so many other things including the one which was unfortunately withdrawn for endothelial cell loss, but there are several other reasons, I guess so. One is the Cypass for glaucoma, which is another amazing tool with a supracoroidal shunt, but I'm sure it will come up in a different form again. So we have, I would say, one of the greatest innovators of the century with us today. It's been a long promise. I've been uh, uh, inviting him for several uh, years now. Thank you, Sean, for coming. And he spent a day in Chennai yesterday today in Pondi and tomorrow he'll be in Madurai and the last day in Auto Lab, where he's going to introduce a new eye dropper, which is again going to change the way we are going to use eye drops in the future. So there are several innovations, but uh, it's a privilege to know him and also to listen to this talk. Welcome, uh, Dr. Shah. Thank you for uh, the kind introduction. Uh, I know it's a little bit like homecoming, long overdue to come back here. Uh, we met literally 2003, so it's been 15 years as I'm reminded. Um, and it's a pleasure for me to be here and, and really see um, a lot happening at Aravind that I wasn't aware. And uh, today the tour was eye-opening. Uh, actually, before I came to uh, the hospital, I had the privilege to go to Oroville and uh, uh, do a little bit of meditation. Actually, I'm very new at this, and I don't know if I did it correctly, but one thing I realized when I woke up from my meditation was uh, that everybody says, Sean, you're going to talk about innovation. You've done so many innovative things. Uh, and at the same time, I realized after Oroville that I'm in a mecca of innovation of itself. And you guys should definitely not uh, underestimate yourselves because what you're doing here is not only innovation, it's amazing. Um, and frankly, people usually think of innovation as a technology or uh, as a new gadget or a new device, maybe a new drug, which is, which is true. That requires a lot of innovation. But what you're also doing at Aravind, and, and it really impresses me, is the process innovation. There are two types of innovations, product innovation, <coughs> and that's the one that I have been involved uh, uh, on, on my, uh, in my path. 
but what you have done here is a lot of process innovation. How do you do half, almost half a million cataract surgeries a year? How do you do surgery for $15? I mean, how do you do uh, five well, millions of patient visits? How do you train so many doctors when I see that? And I'm impressed at, at the amount of capital, return on capital and investment because you're doing it so efficiently. And at the same time, you're not cutting corners. You're delivering excellent care. So um, to me, I just wanted to preface that I'm gonna talk a lot about innovation and how it impacted me and, and how I was in touch with innovation. But at the same time, I wanna say that uh, I think you guys are bringing a ton of innovation uh, uh, to your country, to the world, to ophthalmology, and we shouldn't forget about that. It's, it's slightly different. It's not a product innovation, it is a process innovation, but it's equally as impactful. So with that, uh, I want to take you on a little journey uh, through some of the technologies that I've been involved in. And um, again, with my disclosures, uh, usually when I'm involved with a technology, it's not just in a purely academic sense. Um, I am uh, academically involved and I'm a professor of ophthalmology at New York Pioneer and I enjoy teaching and I enjoy staying connected with my field. <clears throat> but what I realized early on is that if you wanna make an impact and if you wanna be involved with multiple technologies and not operate sequentially uh, and if you're a little bit in a hurry to get stuff done, you have to step out of the academic world. Uh, and especially if you wanna bring products to the market, to patients, today, bringing pr products to patients requires a lot of complicated uh, processes, development, uh, in many cases, regulated environment. So all that doesn't happen by one person. And if you wanna do it, if you wanna be involved and accelerate the process, you really have to step out of the academic world and really engage industry because industry gets the product to market. So uh, here are my disclosures and a, a lot of them are really, most products were brought to market and developed by a different company and as part of that I was involved in their development. So it's been about a decade long process for me, um, a little bit more since I met Venkatesh <clears throat> and we talked a little bit uh, earlier with the residents that some of the innovation can start in residence. In fact, several of the projects uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, started when I was a resident and I was asking questions and usually the question you ask when you're a resident is why? Why is this so? And uh, why can it be another way? And um, uh, one of the technologies, the Aura, which I'll talk about in the intraoperative aberration, uh, aberrometry started when I was a resident, a second year resident. And uh, again, it took me on a path that really changed my life because because of that technology, I ended up getting involved with more projects and uh, going down the path of innovation. Uh, so uh, in a way for me, the, the major uh, technologies I'm gonna touch on today, I'll talk a little bit about Lucentis uh, because again, this impacted uh, the entire field of ophthalmology and uh, uh, it, it really changes how uh, you make an impact on patients. Today, I think that more than half a million patients who are being treated uh, for an, uh, with an anti-VEGF therapy such as Lucentis. And as an innovator, this is how you measure your impact. Um, you can measure it by seeing patients as a clinician. You see a 50 or 100 patients a day. Um, as an innovator, uh, it's really nice to look and know that so many patients benefited, even though you didn't touch them, but you actually were able to touch them through your innovation. Then we'll talk a little bit about Aura and the mix I pass, and all of them have different learning, uh, learning points for me personally through uh, the development of those technologies. So anti-VEGF, today when we treat a patient with Lucentis, we take it for granted, and we say, oh, that's an anti-VEGF, and we're gonna give that for patients with retinal vein occlusion, we're gonna give that to patients with macular degeneration, diabetic macular edema, but when we all started, and actually I was a student at Harvard Medical School, uh, and uh, Judah Folkman, who was the founder of the field of angiogenesis, uh, had a lab for ophthalmology. Uh, at that time, when we looked at the field of uh, angiogenesis and what is at play, there were so many different factors. So one of them was obviously VEGF. Uh, the other one was FGF, PDGF. 
and there were a lot of other diffusible factors at play. We simply didn't know which one was the one that mattered. And a lot of different uh, investigators and uh, researchers took different paths because they explored one or the other. Uh, but again, it took a lot of work to figure out that VEGF was the key driver of new vascularization. And in fact, it's a big, it's a big, all these are big therapeutic approaches in cancer, uh, VEGF treatment, but in ophthalmology, the outcome is most remarkable. Uh, we know what happens when you inject VEGF and how the uh, iris neovascularization responds. You inject a, a PDR patient with the anti-VEGF and immediately dry out the retina. It's really remarkable to see that in the eye. And so when we, we started out on that adventure, we did not expect it's gonna have such a broad impact. So today, uh, it really pleases me when, when the work that I was involved in ophthalmology for uh, Lucentis really translated now to so many diseases. Today we're treating and we've changed the standard of care for retinal vein occlusions, for macular degeneration, for diabetic macular edema, not to mention for kids with ROP and so forth. And in fact, in some cases, people already have moved away from using laser treatment of the retina and really using anti-VEGF. So <clears throat> one thing is to develop a therapy. Another thing is to change the standard of care. It's very difficult to change the standard of care, partially because we as doctors too are not the fastest and earliest adopters, right? We study for so many years to learn a paradigm and then we know that everything new comes at a cost and sometimes there's safety issues. So we are really thoughtful, we're very uh, conservative, most of us as physicians, and we wanna see evidence, which takes time to generate. And even sometimes after you generate evidence, it may turn out that the long-term data may not be as, uh, as uh, supportive. So changing the standard of care is difficult. Uh, so when we have success st stories like uh, Lucentis, it's always very, very pleasing to see. And again, uh, the way we did that was by developing a very robust program of clinical evidence. So we uh, uh, launched the two studies, the MARINA uh, study and, and many others afterwards, such as Anker and PEER. Um, and uh, we realized that Lucentis was consistently delivering uh, across the entire spectrum of, of, of patients. Uh, and you can see the difference if you were uh, uh, before the age of anti-VEGF and macular degeneration patient, once you're diagnosed with wet AMD, you would immediately start losing vision and you would go blind. Today, with uh, anti-VEGF therapy, not only you don't lose vision, but we actually improve your vision. So it's almost like a cataract outcome, right? We, we improve the patient's vision. Hopefully one day in glaucoma, we can do that, but again, uh, in retina, anti-VEGF made a dramatic difference. Uh, and to me, that was really a, uh, uh, a place where once you have a success like that, it's very difficult to stop and, and just do clinical patient care because you realize it's almost like a drug. You're really uh, invested in that process and you see the success and you can see you can make a big impact. Why stop? Uh, so one of the other technologies I started as a resident uh, was the intraoperative aberrometry. And for intraoperative aberrometry, um, we have a um, paradigm that has been around for almost 50 years. And what is that paradigm? Calculating the power of the intraocular lens. And we know that, in fact, when cataract surgery started, people were not even putting intraocular lenses. And then once we started realizing the power of an intraocular lens that we can correct uh, the, uh, the vision uh, with an implant, we had to figure out how to calculate the power. And uh, uh, the technology is about 50 years old, the methodology of IOL power calculation, which we take for granted today. And it basically uh, involves measuring the axial length, measuring the corneal uh, curvature, and using a formula to tell you what kind of IOL. So we've been doing that for 50 years. And the technology and the methodology regardless of which formula you use, whether it's a Hoffer Q or a Holiday or SRKT, uh, the technology goes back uh, 50 years to the Russian uh, methodology of Fyodorov. 
Now, that hadn't been changed for 50 years, and when uh, I started getting patients who had prior refractive surgery, LASIK, I realized that it was really difficult to figure out what power IOL to put in. And sometimes we would have two, three, four diopter refractive surprises early, uh, maybe about 15 years ago, uh, because the formulas could not predict. So this was a, a problem, and it occurred to me that when we do cataract surgery and take out the lens, uh, before we put the implant, we have a very privileged state of the eye, and that state is transient aphakia. At that point in time, when you remove the cataract, before you implant an IOL, you're actually having the eye in a state of transient aphakia, so it's only the cornea and no interference from any, anything else, no lens. And you can take an optical read, an optical biopsy, so to speak, by doing an autorefraction to tell you what is the entire optical deficit. And so I thought that would be an interesting approach because now we can use purely optical means to, and refractive means to derive the power of the uh, IOL, which may be better especially if you've had refractive surgery before. So uh, I started out in 2003. Uh, we didn't have a specific device. The device on the, on the right, which is the Aura, took uh, about uh, six, seven years and $60 million of investment to develop because it's definitely a complicated device called intraoperative avenometer. But before that, I, I was able to leverage existing technology. So I took the auto refractor from the clinic, the portable one, and I would do the cataract surgery, remove the lens, break at that point my sterility, take a quick read of the aphakic state, and then uh, basically uh, uh, put my gloves in, and uh, start again. Uh, and I did the first cases and I realized that by doing an aphakic auto refraction, I could actually figure out the power of the IOL pretty quickly. In fact, one of my uh, colleagues had a big problem. He was a surgeon in Beverly Hills, and he had a lawyer who was a guy who had refractive surgery, LASIK, seven years earlier. And so that per patient came back and um, had cataract. And he was very, very nervous because first, obviously, it's a lawyer, and second, <laughs> and second, he already took his money for the LASIK, not telling him that it would cause some challenges with his cataract surgery, and you don't want to have a lawyer with a plus three or a plus four surprise that you have to do uh, uh, explant the lens. So I actually went into the, right when I got this data, uh, and he had heard about that, he said, Sean, can you help me? I went into the surgery with him. Uh, I did my uh, calculation, and that was the early days. And I remember he had about four pages of calculations because he had done every single formula and fudge factor known to man. And of course, they all came different because at that time we had very li limited experience. And, um, and I basically at that time went in and I did the ref uh, auto refraction uh, and came up with uh, uh, the power. And, I, and, so, and so we looked at all of his predictions and uh, it was in between, they were all over the place, so he went with the power that, uh, that we calculated. And uh, uh, it turned out uh, the refractive error was minus 0.5 or minus 0.6, uh, something was really low, and it turned out well. And that gave me the impetus, I need to continue with that technology and really work to develop it. And we published and published and really took about 10 years of uh, determination and pursuit and really working with the engineers and the company to actually come up with that technology. Uh, and it went through different iterations, right? The, uh, you can see here, the first prototype was orange, and that was not as precise. There were still some challenges. The company actually launched it commercially a little prematurely, and that is dangerous because if you have a device that doesn't work as well, people find out right away, and it really, uh, in, it's not good for the technology, for the adoption, uh, very challenging. So um, with the improvements, the final device was, uh, uh, was very precise, 
right on demand. You can determine the power of the IOL. It can also t tell you the um, uh, toricity and it can uh, tell you about astigmatism and it gives you real time biometry at the time of cataract surgery. Right now, if you have a toric IOL, the device can, after you implant it, it can tell you if you're right on axis, which is great because you know several degrees uh, of misalignment can defeat the purpose of the uh, toric IOL. If you do LRIs, it can tell you if you are right on target with your LRIs for the astigmatism, and it can also tell you what power IOL to use. And by now, as you can see here, we've uh, published a lot of papers in Journal of Ophthalmology, more recently a paper on post-refractive outcomes. And right now, there was a recent paper that came out um, uh, from Utah, and I think it was almost 80,000 cases done uh, in intraoperative apterometry. So it's really nice to see, based on this work now, uh, how several years out we have so many physicians using it. In fact, in my hospital, almost every operating room in the New York Eye Ear now has that. And it's not because of me. Actually, I just went to New York three years ago. They already had bought it because it adds a lot of value to, to the high precision outcome of cataract surgery. So that was the second innovation was intraoperative abenometry. And, um, and again, uh, after going through, uh, through this uh, and uh, surviving, because initially there was a lot of doubt and a lot of people were, were not understanding the technology. And it, it, it became clear that you need to drive adoption and you need to really put a lot of effort to explain it. Uh, when I first started out, a lot of people say, well, who would need that? Who needs a more precise? We're fine with a 0.5 or a 0.75 diopter difference, sometimes a one diopter difference. 20 years ago, there was not so much emphasis on premium IOLs. And, uh, and the patient expectations maybe were different. But look at what's happening now. I think people now expect 2020 vision. They expect to be spectacle free. And being able to do biometry on demand is really important. In fact, what we're gonna see is that our operating rooms will be very much like a cockpit, like the pilot's cockpit. Uh, it used to be that you have the microscope and that's it. With the uh, aura, that was actually, I believe that's the first intraoperative biometry device uh, that, uh, you know, that we, that we brought to market that really uh, started the whole field. And what you're going to see now on is there's going to be a lot of intraoperative biometric uh, and imaging and diagnostic devices that would be ancillary to the microscope. So the microscope will be a platform where we're going to now add intraoperative OCT. We're going to be adding so many things, intraoperative aberometry. We're going to be adding other imaging modalities because they will make us better surgeons and they will improve the precision. So it was really interesting to see. It took 10, 15 years, but right now I think it's opening up a whole field of intraoperative guidance technology and biometric devices. So <clears throat> I'll switch gears and go to something else. Uh, I don't know how often people do glaucoma surgery and implant devices, but I understand that in India, there is quite a bit of uh, implants as well from uh, Ahmed implants, maybe Barveld. Uh, again, that's, we know, compared to cataract surgery, glaucoma is a little more challenging. Um, I tried uh, on one of the missions when uh, I, I went to Latin America, uh, and where we do cataract surgery, I brought once uh, uh, five devices uh, to do uh, Ahmed implants and uh, to teach some of the doctors there. And after the first implantation, I realized uh, this is not really uh, working out as I expected because it took us about an hour and a half to, to do the case and go through systematically. And I realized that in that time, we could have done four or five cataract surgeries <laughs> to help those waiting patients. And then I left the other implants for later on. And uh, I think a year later, when I checked with the doctors, they still hadn't used it because, again, it's really hard to... Uh, look at the utility of glaucoma surgery and compare that to cataract uh, where you can help expo exponentially more patients. Uh, but nevertheless, there is probably a problem then that means that glaucoma surgery is not optimal. I mean, if, if it can't be as, as fast and as efficient and as standardized as cataract surgery, maybe we should think about 
changing glaucoma surgery. It's not the doctors that don't want to help the patients. Of course, if you can help 10 cataract patients see and one or two glaucoma patients kind of see better or control their IOP but not improve their vision, I can understand the utility equation that we would be more interested to help out cataract patients. But that being said, we should come up with better surgical tools for glaucoma. And probably many of you, and particularly the ones if you go to uh, the international conferences, you've heard a lot about MIGS. And that's a new wave, uh, and it's a great, great undertaking by the scientists and by the clinicians and the investigators to bring technology that would, I think, eventually bring glaucoma surgery on par with cataract surgery. Uh, and if you recall many years ago, uh, people used to do a lot of combined phaco trap or a combined cataract surgery with, glau with glaucoma surgery. And that is happening very rarely today. And it begs the question why. In the old days, they would do a combined glaucoma and cataract procedure. Today, that happens almost very rarely in America. And it's partially because cataract surgery is such a great surgery. It, it's such a great outcome, and it's so fast. With glaucoma surgery, conventional tubes and traps, it's very difficult to, to do that case and really see how it would complicate your beautiful cataract case that you can do for five minutes. So I think the two surgeries took a different, they broke the partnership. The cataract surgery really took off because it became procedurally different, better, uh, more standardized. The glaucoma surgery, I think, was left a little bit in the 60s and 70s, and we've ha we haven't had many options uh, besides traps and tubes. Now, actually, the trend is changing. And in fact, in America now, and in Europe, people are using a lot of mixed devices, and they're doing them in combination with cataract surgery. So now we're seeing a resurgence of combined phaco mix or phaco glaucoma surgery, and partially because we've been able to close the gap between cataract surgery and glaucoma surgery. And let's see how that happened. If you look at some of the landscape today for uh, a, a glaucoma surgical options. In the old days, it used to be pretty much trabeculectomy and tubes, only two options, and these are the conventional surgeries. Uh, there is more than nine now. If I have to update that uh, today, I'll probably put another four or five. So that's great. If you're a glaucoma surgeon, you have a lot more options and a lot of great options. Well, where did those options come from? It turns out that ophthalmology is one of the last specialties to adopt interventional technology. If you look at other fields, the cardiovascular field, pulmonary field, uh, urological gastrointestinal surgery, uh, peripheral vascular surgery, people have used stents in those fields for many years, for decades. While in ophthalmology, we've never used stents. So we, we, it, it was something very much uh, uh, unknown. We never applied that technology. And when you look at today with the MIGS, you basically see the final entrance of interventional technology and its application in ophthalmology. So now we're taking stents such as the eye stent, the trabecular stent, the hydrus, which is another trabecular stent that just got approved recently in the US. I worked on the SIPAS, which got approved last year in the US. Uh, for supracroidal uh, outflow. And there will be probably another three or four stents in the next few years. That finally, what we're seeing is the stent technology coming into ophthalmology. And where it's coming I into is glaucoma. Because glaucoma is where we need to reduce pressure by increasing outflow. And to increase outflow, a stent is a good idea. You're creating a space, you're opening a conduit where you can actually direct the aqueous. So the first stent was the eye stent. It came out several years ago, was approved in the US. It was the first uh, micro stent in ophthalmology. Um, and uh, you will see the stent, uh, uh, the data that came out uh, during cataract surgery when you implant it in patients with mild to moderate glaucoma, it leads to better IOP lowering than cataract surgery alone. Now, as you can see, 50% of patients uh, would 
would have a very good more than 20% IOP lowering on their, just with the cataract surgery versus 72% with the eye stent combined with cataract. So it is more effective, but it's not hugely effective. It's not like a trap and a tube, and it's not lowering intraocular pressure as we would normally expect, nor it should, because the point of those stents are to create a safer option, even though the efficacy may be a little lower. So the, the entry of those stents is really in improving safety with some significant efficacy, but not necessarily matching the efficacy of the traps and tubes. Uh, and again, as the first stent on the market, it really opened up the possibilities for other stents, and you can see it created very strong, very strong solid evidence. Uh, these were two-year studies, and most of the stents now that are coming on the market are going through two-year studies and sometimes five-year follow-up data, which is something that we didn't have in glaucoma. There were a lot of studies with traps and tubes that were six months, one year. They were not standardized. They were not done at the quality of an FDA uh, device. But because those are implants and they're going through a device approval passing in the US, those are backed by very high quality data. So I think for all of us as clinicians, this is great because we can compare technologies when we have data. And all of these stents and companies are generating excellent data. You can see these are the uh, safety, this is the safety profile of the eye stent. And again, if you look at the table, it almost doesn't look like a glaucoma surgery. We're not used to seeing <laughs> such a safe procedure because glaucoma surgery with tube and cap traps is something that actually leads to lower visual acuity. In fact, we're trading off uh, in glaucoma surgery with the, the conventional methods, we're trading off intraocular pressure control for reduction in visual acuity. Uh, on average, patients can lose up to two lines of visual acuity in the first couple of years with a conventional trap and tube. And we all know the challenges of explaining to patients who are seeing well and saying, we have to control your pressure, but there is a risk that you may actually end up worse off with your vision when we do surgery. So this is a very difficult trade-off. And when it comes to MIGs and the, uh, the new stents, actually, we don't have to do that because this is a much safer procedure. And uh, you can see while there are uh, uh, certainly some complications in general, the profile of that procedure and of that surgery is much more aligned to the profile of FACO, where we're getting better and better in terms of delivering the outcomes. Now, <clears throat> we have a second stent that is trabecular stent that just got approved. That's the Hydra stent. Uh, and you can see it's much bigger it opens up a bigger part of the trabecular meshwork and the Schlems canal. It expands it. This is the stent. It has a, here is the uh, part that's into the, uh, into the anterior chamber. And the rest of the stent here, you can see three clock hours is in the Schlems canal. And it expands it. It's a scaffold. And it allows better outflow. Um, so that was the second one on the market. I worked on a stent that had a very different uh, uh, conduit or it provided a very different mechanistic approach. Uh, we all know cyclodialysis uh, and in the old days actually cyclodialysis was, was uh, used very often with cataract surgery. Uh, and cyclodialysis works great. It lowers intraocular pressure dramatically. The problem is that it heals and after two, three months it closes. So there is healing and modulation with cyclodialysis that defeats the final outcome uh, and you end up basically where you started, it closes. So if something closes, putting a stent may be a good idea. You wanna put something which will keep it open. So the Cypass implant was designed for that. You can see here, it's implanted in the supraciliary space right above the ciliary body. This is the angle, this is the scleral spur. It goes right below the scleral spur. It creates a small controlled cyclodialysis. And when it's removed, when you remove the guide wire, it basically creates an outflow path for aqueous to go from the anterior chamber to the suprachoroidal space. And the suprachoroidal space is large. It goes around 360, uh, and it's really underlying the entire retina. 
and it can have a huge absorptive capacity. So it's a great place to direct aqueous outflow. And I will show you uh, a video here uh, just to see how the procedure works. Oh. Maybe we're not going to see how the procedure works. I guess. Uh, There you go. Oh, there we go. That works. So you can see the stent is uh, on a guide wire. And after you've completed the cataract surgery, you put in the IOL, uh, you go through the phaco incision, and um, you approach the opposite side, the, uh, the angle. You go right above the iris root. And of course, we use, for all of these procedures, we use a gonio lens. So it requires a slightly different skill. Right? You have to be able to use uh, gonio surgery and be able to use the gonio lens. And then you have the landmarks. You can see the trabecular meshwork, sclerospur, and, and also the iris root. And you go right above the iris root and below the sclerospur. Initially, when you, when you push forward, you may find out some resistance because you're maybe too far above. But if you're in the right space, it literally goes like you go into butter. It's very soft. It doesn't require any effort. And once you're in position, and once you've implanted the stent to the sufficient depth, you disengage, and the guide wire comes out, and the stent is in position. And you can see perfect position means it has to have a very small part of the stent in the anterior chamber, and it has to be implanted up to the uh, first retention ring. Now, let's go to the next one. Now, why is that important? Let's see. Okay, so you can see here the stand with the different retention rings. Let's go through the, we saw the video. Okay, and the study that we did for two years showed excellent uh, intraocular effect of IOP lowering, uh, and also uh, it showed very good safety profile at two years. And this was the study that all of the stents have to do. Now, at five years, in the extended safety follow-up, it was found that the endothelial cell uh, in the stent group experienced a higher degree of loss than the uh, control group of cataract surgery. You can see here, here is your cataract surgery, and actually here it's cut out a little bit where you have the uh, ECL, the endothelial cell loss, versus the 18% and 20% of the SIFAS group. And it was interesting because you can see in the first two years, actually, there was no loss. There was no evidence of any problem. In fact, uh, it started showing up at four years and five years. So this is kind of sometimes the uh, unpredictability of drug and device development and of innovation. You don't know what you're going to find, and sometimes you don't know what you're going to find two, three, four, five years out. So that was interesting because um, it really led to other questions. Now, SIPAS was the first stent to generate data from the pivotal studies with five-year follow-up. And what we showed there is that after two years, you have great intraocular pressure lowering and you have great safety. But after f year four and five, we started picking up some safety concern with endothelial cell loss. The question is, is that a s effect that's specific to the SIPAS or is that an effect that is a class effect for anything that has hardware in the angle and in the anterior chamber? And we know that could also be the case for eye stent or hydras. And we really need to then look and see where is the five-year data. And when the five-year data becomes available to make sure we can understand it and see if there is the same thing. Because at two years, and the two-year data doesn't seem to be predictive of the five-year data. Obviously, at two years with the SIPAS, we had no problems. At five years, it started cropping up. So the question is, is that the, what's happening with some of the other stands? And we don't know because they haven't yet produced five-year data. So it's really important when that data becomes available to really examine it carefully and see if this is something that's particular to each stand or is it something that's a class effect 
for all these mixed devices. So the debate continues. As you see, in innovation, the debate continues. It's unknown, and we learn with every year. So I want to take a little uh, detour from glaucoma surgery and uh, go back to cataract surgery. And one of the things about cataract surgery is that even though we feel that it has advanced so much, right? If you look at the machines today and, and the machines even five years ago, there's torsional FACO, there's all these, you know, better fluidics control. Uh, the, the screens definitely look better. <laughs> the LCDs are, are prettier, right? They're more intelligent, or so we think, right? But I can argue also that the FACO hasn't changed very much. And uh, again, we're talking about 50 years of FACO. We celebrated the 50 years uh, anniversary of FACO. And in fact, Kelman, who was from New York and uh, the institution where I am at New York, New York uh, Eye and Ear Infirmary, uh, invented the FACO uh, 50 years ago. And I said, well, let me look at how do we make a phone call 50 years ago. And you can see it was a very different phone than the smartphone you have today. And then I said, well, let's look at how we make and how, how was the FACO machine 50 years ago. And again, we have evolved quite a bit through the different stages of surgery until we reach the FACO. And I want to come to the FACO side, uh, slide in a, in a second here. And you can see the FACO machine. It, the first FACO machine was the Cavitron 50 years ago. And uh, it definitely looks different, but it's still a pretty big machine. And if you compare the, the FACO machine of today to the FACO machine of uh, 50 years ago, it hasn't changed that much. It definitely looks a little cuter, and I think it has, uh, uh, it sparkles more uh, uh, and more futuristic, but it occupies the same footprint in your OR, probably a bigger one now. And if you look at the FACO probe 50 years ago, this is the FACO probe they used then in the Cavitron, and the FACO probe of today it's not very different. I, I mean, definitely one can say it's, it's improved. Uh, it, it looks uh, incrementally better. But again, it's the same FACO probe fundamentally. Definitely hasn't improved as much as the difference between the phone uh, 50 years ago, uh, the rotary phone, and the smartphone of today. Right? That technology has changed dramatically. And if we have to ask ourselves, well, what are some of the deficiencies of FACO today, what are some of the challenges? There are quite a few. Number one, uh, regardless of whether it's the FACO of yesterday and the FACO of today, w any FACO machine puts energy, actually thermal energy, uh, into the eye, which we know is not good. It's not good for the endothelium, and it's, not, and it's something that increases exponentially when your cataract grade increases. Uh, again, we talked about endothelial cell loss with some of the uh, stents, but we all know that when you do cataract surgery, you lose about anywhere from 10 to 40 to 50 percent of your endothelium just with cataract surgery alone. We don't measure it unless we do a study, but I've actually been involved in studies where we've measured it, and I've had surgeons who are great surgeons uh, who were surprised when they actually saw the endothelial cell loss. It's something we don't see, but it is something that happens with every phaco surgery today we take away endothelium, which we cannot regenerate. Now, you can see the other thing is we know that FACO is very challenging when you have hard cataracts. And I think uh, at some point when, when you have a very hard cataract, you say, I'd better do a small incision <laughs> extra cup than do a FACO, because you know you'll do a better job, and you know you'll save the patient a lot of post-operative uh, pain and suffering with the corneal edema. The other thing is the learning curve of FACO. I don't know what uh, the experience is here at the Aravind. I think in general, in the institutions where I've been at UCSF and, and New York Pioneer, it's at least 200 cases for a resident to feel comfortable with cataract surgery. And then to become a really good cataract surgeon, you probably need to do 1,000 to feel like you have a grip on this. But again, the learning curve is not simple because it's a complicated technology. There's fluidics, there's energy, Again, there's chopping, different variants, so nothing trivial. And again, the other part is this capital expense. 
these are expensive machines, and sometimes actually maintaining them is more expensive than just buying them. Now you can see here, there's many studies, but it definitely shows when the grade of the cataract increases, the energy inside the eye goes up dramatically. And also, the endothelial loss increases dramatically. We also know that today, there's about 25 million people blind from cataracts in the world. And although India has done a tremendous job, I mean, to do seven million cataracts a year, uh, you guys rocking it here. I mean, it's amazing. You probably have solved to a big degree the problem here. But if you go to Africa and Latin America and other countries, even next door China, uh, you know, same population, they should be doing about seven to eight million cataracts. I think the last numbers I, I looked at were two million. So there's a huge deficit of cataract surgery. So <coughs> why haven't we solved that problem? <coughs> and in fact, in many countries, people can buy now the FACO machines or they can be donated. Well, it's because it's not just the FACO, it's really the training, the adoption, all of the things that go with it. So FACO, in a way, as being so great and, and really has changed the pattern and the paradigm, it really hasn't fulfilled the promise of helping us solve cataract blindness in the world. And it's something that really requires a lot of energy and pushing to get to that point because it's such a difficult technology to adopt and it's an expensive technology to adopt. So what does that mean? Well, people often say true north. You know, there is a difference between true north and magnetic north. If you want to go somewhere where we call uh, true north and, and uh, understand what is the solution or what is the root cause of a problem. I said, well, can we find a way to, let's first look at the fragmentation. To fragment the cataract, we currently use uh, FACO, but FACO has all these problems associated with it. Can we do the fragmentation of the lens by using minimum or zero energy fragmentation? Can we do it so that it's a true fragmentation, not partial chop, not uh, uh, superficial chop, <coughs> but full thickness, full fragmentation? Can we do that so that it's effective on any cataract grade? As I call it, mild to wild, from a grade one to a brunescent. Can it be something that's single use, easy to use, disposable, and can it be done very quickly in an adoptable way, people can learn it and can transfer that skill set without increasing the complexity of surgery. And so when we tried to come up with the, with the solution, we looked into in the interventional fields, uh, cardiovascular interventions, where they have been using a technology called nitinol-based stenting. And nitinol is an alloy and it's a very, very interesting alloy because unlike steel or any steel instrumentation, it has two very important properties. One of the properties is super elasticity. That means it can contract and expand much more than uh, steel can. And it can go from a very small shape to a very big shape without breaking. And number two, number two is memory shaping. Every time it goes from one position to another, it can go to exactly the same position and not bend and not break. So nitinol is great. I'm su I was surprised that we really haven't used it very much in the field of ophthalmology. And again, if you go to other fields, you can see that, uh, thank you. Yeah, you can see that uh, in other fields, they've been using it for a long time. And they've been using it because of those properties. So I will show you here the... Um So as you can see, uh, the my loop, and we have now different versions as uh, we've also demonstrated some cases with the by loop too, but it really allows you to do something that we haven't been able to do before. 
we can break up the cataract in the bag, endocapsular, without energy and without using phaco. And also, you can do that full thickness for the entire cataract. As you can see, the cut goes from the bottom of the cataract to the top, and everything is cut in, in between. And then the other thing that is very interesting is, <coughs> and I think you will appreciate when you start using the MyLoop, is when you chop, we chop by creating and separating the lens with centrifugal forces, meaning we chop from the inside out. We take the instruments and then we chop and we separate and we usually spread. And in the process, we're stretching the bag, we're stretching the zonules. But that is centrifugal, meaning the force goes from the center to the out. When you cut and you fragment the lens with the Milo, actually it goes from the outside to the, in, to the center. And that's what we call centripetal. So it, it's for the first time that we can actually cut the lens in a centripetal way. Why is that important? If you have unstable zonular apparatus, if you have pseudo exfoliation, if you want to be extra careful with your bag, probably it's better to cut in a centripetal way than in a centrifugal way. And I think that's fundamentally different when you're looking at this technology and how this fragments the lens compared to FACO. The whole nucleus disassembly process is completely different mechanistically. And what you can see here is another interesting video. We did that at the Murana Institute because, and, and I think Venkatesh said, oh, that looks scary. You know, initially when you don't know, you're going right to the bag. You're going to the periphery. And initially can definitely scare people a little bit. But when you look at it from a Miyagi view, and this shows you how the loop goes around the cataract, hugs it, and then cuts it in half, you can see that there is almost no tension on the capsular bag. Look at this, the entire cut was happening, you didn't even see any stretching. So it's very nice to see that and appreciate that even though it's counterintuitive at the beginning, you are going to the periphery and you're going closer to the capsule than you've ever been before. At the same time, you're very gentle, you're cutting centripetally, and you're minimizing the stress and the forces on the back. Here it is, we cut it in four pieces. And when you do that, it actually not only cuts, but also releases the pieces from the capsule, and it allows you to do much faster IA, and it allows you to take those pieces and then engage them with the FACO or with another instrument, as may be the case in the future, that, that allows you to clean out the bag and then put your IOL in. And again, there are a lot of surgeons now that use that not only for hard cases, they use it also for uh, soft cases. Sometimes, in fact, I think as residents find out that chopping a soft cataract may be a little challenging. It, it's, uh, when it's soft, it, the fracture doesn't propagate. So uh, in fact, uh, w I've had sometimes problems with residents where they bowl out the cataract very easy because they think, oh, this is kind of soft and easy and you start going but it's not chopping and you start eating smaller pieces and then suddenly you have a ball. Uh, again, that doesn't happen with the Milo because it really cuts through everything regardless of how hard the cataract is. Um, and for a lot of surgeons, they find out that by going to the outside, it follows in the same hydrodissection plane and it micro dissects, it mechanistic, mechanically dissects further and it also sweeps the cortex and it allows you to release it very easily. Uh, again, uh, the technology we introduced a few years back, a couple of years back, but it really took off. In fact, within the first year of introduction, it got all the awards at ASCRS, and a lot of our doctors in America had really embraced it. Uh, I get calls and, and I get emails saying it saved my case, especially in the difficult ones, and because that's what it's designed to do. It's designed to take care of the surgeon, to lower your heart rate, to make you better so you can go home and spend time with your families and kids and, and really not worry about those cases because the cases we all worry about are the cases that don't go well. Like nobody worries about an easy case and, and it's a beautiful case you go home. The cases that we worry about are the ones that are hard 
uh, the cases that you worry about whether you should have them as your first case of the day or the last case of the day because you worry that if you have it at the front, it's going to really destroy your day <laughs> or if you have it at the end, you'll be tired, right? So we want all of these cases to go easier and more predictably and that's what the my loop helps. Now, the my loop is really, I think, the beginning. Uh, it's not just, I think, a single instrument, but it's a strategy. As I said, we want to reduce the footprint. We want to reduce the energy. We want to change dramatically how cataract surgery is done. And while the my loop does the first step, which is the fragmentation, then we still have to deal with the, with the segments, with the fragments that we have in the eye. And this is the second instrument that we haven't yet introduced. It's in the final stages of development but it's a second pen that doesn't have any, any uh, major box attached to it. That's the entire device. It doesn't have a pedal. The pedal is on the pen. And it allows you to take out the cataract without any phaco energy, without any thermal energy. So once you use the MyLoop to fragment it, then you can use the MyPort, which is the second technology to extract the segments. And I hope we'll see that in action here. Uh, and especially you guys will be the most qualified to try it out because you'll probably be the, the best experts with the MyLoop technology, which is step one of the two-step process. So look forward to this collaboration and I'm very excited uh, to really. <laughs> so I want to talk about one more technology. I know it's late, <coughs> but <coughs> I think it's something that really deserves mention. A lot of the things we talked about was increasing the precision of your surgery, of your intervention, and going micro. Micro stents in glaucoma were really making things smaller and better, safer. So micro stents, micro interventions, my loop is a micro interventional technology. Well, how about therapeutics? How about drugs? Can they be smarter? Can they be smaller? And uh, I will show you a situation which I'm sure you face all the time, uh, if you look. So this was a patient of mine who um, her, her daughter had moved out a couple of months and she came back several times and her pressure was going back up. Her pressure was like now 25, 26. Uh, she had long-standing glaucoma and she was heading for trabeculectomy or tube and again, before we took her, I, we asked the question, well, why is your pressure not responding? It was responding so well before for the next, and we didn't change the drop. She was on two drops, uh, suddenly changed. Well, we, we realized that when her daughter moved out, she was the one that ended up taking care of her own drops because there was nobody there to put the drops in. And she's a pretty independent lady, but she usually had her daughter help out. And you can see when she puts the drops, uh, half of them, or actually most of them, were out. And it turns out, I've been now doing that on a quite a few patients, I can tell you that more than 50% of patients don't put their drops correctly. And studies were done from John Hopkins to many other institutions, and they put that number at more than 50%. So more than 50% of the time, people miss their eye or they don't put the right dose. And then, when they do, actually there is another movie to the side that doesn't come, but when they do, most of the dose is on the cheek, on the floor, doesn't get into the eye, so it's wasted. Uh, and again, even if you look at a single eye drop, so half of the time patients miss the dose, then the other half, they let's say, are lucky enough to get one or two drops in. Well, a single drop, I know we think of it as a small amount of uh, a fluid, but a single drop is about 50 microliters, 40 to 50 microliters. And the other interesting thing is that our entire tear film and the capacity of the eye to hold fluid is about seven microliters. So it seems like we've been overdosing, we're overdosing every time we give a single eye drop by a factor of 300, 400%. Now, where does that all go? That goes into the ocular adnexa, that goes through the nasolacrimal duct, especially with the kids, that goes into their circulation, right? We know the, the beta blockers, the side effects are drops your heart rate, respiratory rate, makes you fatigued, impotence. These are real systemic effects that come with those eye drops. It's partially because when, when the drop doesn't end up in the eye or around the eye, a lot of it goes into the nasolacrimal duct. 
And by going into the nasal lacrimal duct, it goes directly into your systemic circulation and bypasses the liver. So that's almost like an intravenous, right? It's an intravenous axis. So people have actually looked at that, people much smarter than me, with many academic studies, and they've shown that they've actually looked at what can happen if you give smaller and smaller doses. And they have shown that doses as, as low as three microliters are just as effective as an eye drop. So you, you can decrease the dose by a factor of 10 and decrease the exposure of the eye to drug and preservative, which we know it's not good because 90% of your drops are more a preservative. So you can decrease all the dose and go down to three microliters and still get the same effect, yet reduce all of the other side effects. Well, how do we do that? We haven't been able to. A lot of the studies that I mentioned here, all these studies were done with micro pipettes, the same long pipettes that are done for the lab work. Well, that's not practical. And in fact, we haven't had a good way to deliver a microdose because the dropper is about 50 microliters, but we don't have a way to deliver a, a smaller amount. Until recently, when Kurt and I uh, got excited about a technology called piezo printing, piezo ejection. It's the same technology that your inkjet printer uses. And what is it? It literally uses the piezo printing, the vibration with very precise vibration to generate a micro stream of micro droplets. And really, as you know, it prints a small pixel by pixel picture. So your inkjet printer basically directs a very precise jet of fluid of ink to a single pixel. And then with all the pixels, it builds a picture. Well, this does exactly the same. It pixelates the micro jet and the micro dose and creates a stream of micro droplets and it prints them on the ocular surface in a very precise way. And not only that, it actually does it very fast. Somebody asked me before about the blink reflex. It, it's true, patients blink. So if you try to uh, uh, deliver a dose uh, to the eye, they're most likely going to blink. Well, this actually is able to deliver the microdose in 80 milliseconds, and a blink reflex is about 100 milliseconds. So it actually beats the blink reflex. So before they can generate a blink, the microdose is already printed on the ocular surface. So it does a, a lot of things in a, many, in, a, in a quite a groundbreaking way that we haven't been able to do before. Let's review that. Number one, it delivers a microdose. It can go down to single digit micro volumes, which are physiologic, which are the volumes that your tear film capacity can hold. Number two, it delivers the dose horizontally. You don't have to wait for the drop to fall as we normally do. And for many patients, they can't even flip their head back because they have neck pain and posture difficulties. So this one, you can actually deliver it by looking into the window. And when you press a button, it delivers it horizontally. So it's the first time we can actually do horizontal delivery. Number three, it actually delivers it directly on the cornea. It has a targeted delivery to deliver the microdose on the cornea. Why? Because we know cornea is where 90% of the bioavailability happens. If you want a drug to go into your eye, in, inside the eye, you have to go through the cornea. 90% of it goes through the cornea. Well, where do we currently deliver eye drops? In the fornix. It's a little bit far from the cornea. It's in the conjunctiva. And the conjunctiva is where 90% of the side effects are. All the hyperemia, all the irritation, the redness comes from the conjunctiva. So we are actually delivering it in the wrong place when it comes to the eye drop. So this delivers it directly on the cornea. And then it has another feature. It connects with your phone. It's a smart technology with smart functions. And it has an intelligent feature to connect with your phone and record and deliver information about every time you gave a dose. So wouldn't it be nice when the patient comes to know, are they 10% compliant or 90% compliant? So we're currently blind in the dark because we don't know wh what that patient's compliance is. But we do know that average compliance rates on average are 50%. So that means some patients are 10, others are 90, and everything in between. But that doesn't help me when I see a patient knowing that it's a 50% compliance rate, how that patient is doing. 
So with that technology, here, that part of it is actually electronics, and it, it, it communicates with, uh, uh, with the smartphone and through that to the cloud. So when the patient comes to you, or if you have your kids, uh, elderly, the kids can actually know about their compliance, help them, and it can also send you reminders and enhance your compliance. So now we're talking about not just a new delivery, but intelligent therapy. And uh, kind of that's what I talked about in uh, at the APO Congress, is about intelligent therapeutics. Not only artificial intelligence, but intelligence in terms of how we treat our patients. So I want to show you a little video here of uh, how, uh, how this therapy actually works and how the kids actually would deliver it. One of our programs is in Atropine. Introducing the OptiJet by Inovia, part of his nighttime routine. Prime, look, and shoot. It's that easy. Plus, it's pretty cool. Inovia. It's so, it's so uh, gentle that when, and we've done it multiple times, and when you think about people ask, well, how, what do you feel? The only thing you feel is a feeling of wetness. So you know that the dose went in, um, but it doesn't hurt. And in fact, what happens is after the first couple of times, I've, I've done it with my son as well, after the first couple of times, you just learn that it's not gonna hurt you and you actually inhibit your blink reflex. Because you know it's there, you just keep your eyes open. So it's really that gentle. And again, it's time to change the game and go micro with uh, ocular therapeutics. Why? This is what happens with an eye drop. This is where we need to be. It's a different thing, right? So high precision. better care. Just imagine if we can give our prostaglandins, our beta blockers, all of these treatments precisely to the cornea and get the most out of the dose. Maybe we don't even need <laughs> another thera therapeutic category. Maybe we can increase the efficacy of all those drugs dramatically by just giving them better. Instead of getting a 20 or 25 percent on average, maybe you get 30 or 35 percent with the same drugs with lower doses, with less safety problems, and it can become better treatment. And on top of that, by enhancing their compliance, you can get not only better efficacy, but better effectiveness. Because effectiveness is very different. What we read in a journal, and I think for the residents too, when you read a study, that is the efficacy in a clinical trial with patients being constantly coached and monitored. What happens in the real world, you see here at the hospitals at the Aravind, the real world is very different. And what Aravind, it hit me now, delivers is not just efficacy, you deliver effectiveness. And we have a big disconnect in medicine between all the studies that we do, which are all about efficacy in a, in a very standardized and often unreal environment. And when you go out and if you give the same drugs to the patients, you actually get a very different result because Really, if the patient is only 20% compliant, well, you basically shave off 80% of your efficacy. So with that, I want to thank you. Continue to innovate. And uh, again, thank you very much for hosting me here at the Arabic. It's been tremendous. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Uh, so we were some of the first users of MyPort. No, we are very proud to say it. Myself, uh, our chairman, Dr. Ravi uh, Pawan here. Uh, I think very few people used in APA were where it was first introduced. So it's really honey, I shrunk the machine. You have to believe. When it's going to come up, you are going to believe. No more uh, you're going to have a huge machine standing behind you and saying, I am intelligent. Hmm? I have an active fluidics. So this is a real game changer. I mean, that kind of innovation uh, 
uh, Sean has done, and uh, he has also motivated many of us. No, it's not only uh, the tools and the big gadgets. It's, it's what uh, we all do in a daily practice. No, we do a lot of uh, systematic innovations in our systems and the way we take eye care to millions of people. So I'm sure uh, some of these innovations, I mean, we'll also partner with you. And uh, welcome to the hackathon next year. And be our shark. Uh, this is a request. Is there any any questions or in anything you want to add? Uh, 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 Dr. Adyar is there in uh, Madurai. No, I mean, there are no questions, but I would like to thank Sion for coming over to Aravind and also for this innovative lecture. I, as Venkatesh said, and I also had used that lens fraction unit. It's something very fantastic. I mean, it's a very different way of doing cataract surgery. I think I'm sure that it will make a, a big difference, especially in terms of heat generation, which is not going to be there. I think we may see much better corneas. We may be able to tackle maybe much harder cataracts with the combination of this my loop and that my port. So we look forward to learn from you, Kian. I mean, looking forward to your visit to Madurai as well. Thank you. So we have uh, uh, our uh, physics professor who silently joins for most of our discussions. You can see him sitting there, Professor Srinivasan, who has been, and again, a very inspiration for a lot of young ophthalmologists to innovate. And uh, he developed the instrument maintenance department uh, across all the Arabins. He worked with us for many years before he had a second retirement when he was 80 plus. Sir, you want to, you want to say something, sir, from there? In, in between, we were hearing your voice. Maybe the mic was on. Mic. Nothing, nothing in particular. Anyway, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Nice to hear your voice after thanks. a long time. <laughs> Babu, you want to ask something? Uh, Dr. Manor Babu from Salem. Uh, no, no, it was very, it was a very nice talk, and uh, for the first time, I've, I, I saw uh, the, uh, the surgical uh, videos. Uh, it was very nice. Uh, are, we, are, we, are we doing all this uh, on a regular basis on uh, regular patients? One, my first question. The second one, I know we are. Is it available commercially? My my loop is available, and my loop is being uh, widely used in U.S. by several leading ophthalmologists, including David Chang, Alan Crandall, who are our good friends, and we have been also using it uh, for quite some time now. No, Haripriya has got a good experience. Manas here has done uh, a lot of cases with my loop. Uh, some of our young surgeons like Pawan Annamalai are, are being trained by my loop. So basically they're getting trained to uh, do a study uh, to see the learning curve of my, my loop and phaco emulsification in somebody who is getting trained to do a small incision. Now after their SICS, when they are getting converted into phaco, we are saying we are, we are going to look at the learning curve between uh, my loop, mini cap, and the phaco. So we are just preparing our surgeons for that. Uh, the Inovia is still not in the market. My port is yet to yet to be there. So it's uh, it'll. Uh, the, I think th these two gadgets will uh, will be there soon. I, 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 thank you. Nice talk. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Thank you, Babu. Is there any other uh, questions from Coimbatore or Tunnel Valley before we close? It was a wonderful lecture, Dr. Sean. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it was a real eye, especially the Inovia, because uh, as uh, you pointed out regarding the preservative, we have a lot of problems with preservative related complications also. So it will be a, go a big way in uh, preventing that also. And uh, systemic complication, especially in children, pediatric cases, if you get that. And it looks so simple. The only thing is, I wanted to ask is whether uh, uh, whether the patient feels like a splash, or I mean, whether, how will the patient feel whether the drop is gone in or not? 
they feel only that wetness like what Sean was saying. So you can feel the wetness and uh, 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 there won't be any, uh, any other feeling other than the feel of wetness. You may have to apply and feel it, Meenakshi. Okay. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll get it soon. Kurt has always had, had that device in his pocket. <laughs> so I tried it once. Now you can feel the wetness, that's what I can say. But uh, 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 we don't know how between individual the feeling would change, but you can feel. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for uh, the great talk, uh, Sean, and uh, uh, thanks for all the colleagues joining from the other centers. Uh, it, sh it should not be your first and the last visit. It should be the first of many future visits, and I'm sure you're going to motivate a lot of our uh, uh, ophthalmologists you know, to think like this, to shrink a lot of things and to shrink also a lot of things. <laughs> so we'll, we are looking forward for a lot of great innovations from our team. I'm sure they're going to trouble you. I'm going to give you your email address and see how many of them trouble you. Thank you again for coming and uh, thank you.